we have with us Anantan Rajasekhar. He's a blockchain trainer and research engineer at Kerala Blockchain Academy. He's a judicious developer and a blockchain enthusiast with more than two years of experience in multiple blockchain domains. He's a part of the Ethereum and Coda research development team of KBA. On behalf of KBA Women Connect, I extend my heartfelt gratitude for Anandan for sparing his precious time with us. Over to you, Anandan. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you for the welcome. Today, uh, we'll be, um, I mean, I'll be discussing about the Ethereum blockchain technology, the journey of Ethereum blockchain technology. So uh, we'll be going through uh, how the history, uh, the different mechanism features of uh, blo Ethereum blockchain technology and the application on top of that. And finally, I'll end it with a demonstration of a sample application. Ethereum can be said to be most of, uh, one of the most uh, popular and uh, one, one of the uh, best Ethereum block, uh, blockchain out there. And it has a vast variety of different people interacting with it and uh, working on the improvement of the Ethereum technology. So, yeah. So as an introduction, um, when uh, the uh, Bitcoin blockchain was introduced, the world was uh, very happy about that. I mean, we got a new and innovative mechanism in which we can move forward in, in, the, in the financial domain. I mean, the financial domain had many, uh, many technological improvements, but uh, a technological improvement like Bitcoin, which was a decentralized financial platform, was new to that domain. So everyone was happy and everyone focused on the financial aspect of Bitcoin. At that time, nobody actually realized the uh, potential of blockchain. Everyone was uh, concentrated on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain technology. The blockchain, which was actually the backbone of the Bitcoin, uh, which was used to store all the financial transactions that was happening on the network, was more than just uh, a financial or a ledger. So uh, after time passed, people began to realize this, that uh, we can't really constrain blockchain technology only to the financial background or financial domain. We need to expand it. We need to let it uh, open its wings and fly it to the sky so that it can realize its potential. So that actually led to the creation of Ethereum. Ethereum is uh, just, uh, just like the predecessor is an um, open blockchain, anyone can access it. And it, it is uh, also a banking for everyone. Basically, just like Bitcoin, it can be used as a financial platform, a decentralized distributed financial platform. And even though Ethereum has some credentials like a username or password, uh, uh, it is not actually tied to any real world identity information. So you remain anonymous on the Ethereum blockchain network, just like in the Bitcoin network. I mean, then it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's censorship resistant. I mean, basically, uh, if, you, if you want to put something on the internet, you will ha always have to go through some censorship management, uh, IP rights, all those things. You have to uh, look through those things. But uh, if you want to put something, you, you build something, you build something after a um, lot of hard work and you want to put something, then you don't really know, need to go through this censorship, all those things. You can directly uh, put that into the Ethereum blockchain and uh, uh, the customers, the internet customers can access that. The commerce is guaranteed. Uh, just like I said before, there is no boundary within Ethereum. If you have an application, if you have a, uh, a genuine use case, then you can put that on your blockchain network and it, the customers, uh, the intended customers can always access that. There is, there is no problem in accessibility. So uh, any business that is built, going to be built on top of Ethereum, it has its commerce guaranteed. Then it has a huge, uh, a huge number of developer communities that is set up around the Ethereum network. Uh, so uh, yeah, these are the, what we call uh, the Ethereum blockchain, but what, what can we simply say about an Ethereum blockchain? So Ethereum was a uh, first of its kind, a uh, general purpose programmer blockchain technology. To elaborate on that, uh, at the time when Bitcoin was introduced, there was no general purpose programmer blockchain. If you had an idea, and it needed the implementation of blockchain as, as its backend, then you had to fork uh, the code of, for blockchain for the, uh, block, Bitcoin. Then you have to modify it to your needs. Then only you have your own blockchain. Otherwise, you don't have, you can't deploy your 
uh, your application on top of Bitcoin. So that was uh, Ethereum. Uh, it was one of a kind. There was there was not actually at the time of uh, release of Bitcoin. There wasn't any other um, blockchain that was in like a fork or uh, that was not uh, similar to uh, Bitcoin. So it was one of a kind at that time, and uh, it was a general purpose programmable blockchain technology. Now let's uh, let's understand how this came to be. So as I uh, mentioned before, uh, the potential of blockchain was constrained to the financial domain at the time of Bitcoin release. Uh, but uh, gradually, people come to realize that they need to uh, do uh, implement the blockchain on other uh, other domains also. So one person uh, who had same thought process, known as um, Vitalik Buterin. Created the uh, created something called Bitcoin Magazine, which was a community that was formed around Bitcoin. I mean, uh, when Bitcoin was introduced by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto in 2019, a lot of people were interested. Traders, business personals, uh, developers, researchers, uh, many people uh, came together and formed many community around this uh, Bitcoin technology. And uh, Vitalik Buterin co-founded a community called Bitcoin Magazine, which was uh, for the sole purpose of releasing a content towards cryptocurrency or blockchain technology or Bitcoin technology altogether. They released contents uh, uh, for like articles related to cryptocurrencies or uh, financial technologies like these. I mean, it was mainly uh, concentrated on the Bitcoin uh, technology. Then um, Vitalik realized that the blockchain technology needs to be more elaborate or it doesn't need to be constrained to uh, this financial sector so he proposed a scripting language i mean if you have an idea if you have a, a solution that needs the implementation of blockchain then uh, they can just we can just script that idea into the blockchain and deploy our application so bitcoin sorry uh, vitalik proposed something like this to the uh, bitcoin blockchain but at that time community really did, wasn't into it and so that proposal was turned down. But Vitalik, uh, he didn't give up hope. Uh, in, around uh, 2013, he worked with uh, a project, I mean, a company in a project called Colored Coins. And at that time, he developed, uh, uh, or he developed a draft paper about the concept of Ethereum. An outline was made uh, how this blockchain should be, how this blockchain should move on, how this blockchain should work. The uh, basic concept that a big blockchain or a one blockchain for every application out there. So basically, for the entire block uh, world, there should be one blockchain. So that was the concept Vitalik introduced. So this was outlined in the uh, paper in 2013. Uh, it was a draft uh, white paper. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> in January 2014, uh, the formation of uh, Ethereum was announced in a North American Bitcoin conference. So, I mean, there, there were a lot of conferences that happening at that time. So, uh, Vitalik and his team announced that they were going to release uh, such a concept or such a, uh, such a blockchain, and they named it Ethereum. Then, a um, uh, lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of people were attracted to into this, and uh, one of the founders called Gavin Wood, he actually proposed another paper an yellow paper, uh, which laid out the mathematical foundation or reasoning for the Ethereum. I mean, uh, as you know, the Bitcoin technology or the blockchain technology in general is actually a combination of many domains like distributed computing, decentralized, um, uh, decentralized then uh, consensus. There are uh, many uh, solutions or many protocols that are uh, into, in this technology. So he actually uh, defined all these protocols. Gavin Wood actually defined all these protocols for the Ethereum blockchain. I mean, you have to be you had, you had to customize a little bit for the Ethereum blockchain, but he did that. And which was actually a very good foundation laid out. So based on this, in August of uh, the same year, they started a crowd sale, a crowdfunding uh, for this project. And around 40 million US dollar was uh, acquired in, this, in that crowd sale. And uh, like uh, the, I mean, if, if you are going to invest into something, you will be promised to something in return, right? So. Ether, uh, which was actually just like Bitcoin, uh, the native cryptocurrency proposed for Ethereum was Ether. And this was given 
as a as uh, for those people that invested in the ethereum project those who trusted the uh, potential of ethereum project then all the hard working actually came into existence when they released their first version in 2015 called frontier and the blockchain network it, which is a test network but it came into existence so that's how the journey of uh, ethereum was released in 2015 and after that many many iterations are, until now has been released but that was the starting of the, the actual starting of the network the founders includes vitalik buterin de lorio charles oxins mialis amir chitari and uh, later on joseph lupin kevin wood and jeffrey wickel these were the people i mean uh, the first five were the first five and these were the people that came after uh, the release of the paper and uh, all the stuff so uh, this is the journey of ethereum let me just uh, discuss a little bit about the descent philosophy of ethereum the ethereum doesn't uh, have uh, something called features because the reason is that you can create any feature inside ethereum so the universality descent philosophy mentions that there is nothing as features of ethereum i mean there are some things that are inbuilt but if you don't find a feature inside ethereum then you can code it you can code it using the stripping language that is on top of ethereum which is called smart contract you can code your uh, logic in that and deploy that to the blockchain so basically if you uh, if, if you want to build a uh, artificial neural linguistic uh, ai on top of that then you can code it you don't really need to uh, worry about the features not existing if you have the idea then you can go ahead and code it then simplicity so one of the main philosophy or main uh, design uh, mechanics of ethereum is that if you are going to develop a protocol or develop a mechanism for ethereum or any already existing mechanism in ethereum should be simple even at the cost of space time inefficiency that means if it it may it might take too much space or uh, it may take too much time to execute but that's not a problem it has to be simple any person i mean basically they are aiming that uh, uh, it's a community building project right so people should be able to understand it and it so we should keep it simple now next one was a uh, model at any protocol as i mentioned before uh, it's a combination of many different kind of protocols a uh, messaging um, protocols peer to peer communication protocols uh, uh, storage protocols in in indexing uh, like storage indexing protocol so there are many kind of protocols or any kind of mechanism that is inbuilt in ethereum so these mechanisms should be modular i mean uh, the uh, the improvement or the development on top of ethereum should not only focus on ethereum like if you if if someone else is building a blockchain like after ethereum was introduced there were many other blockchain technologies that were introduced like uh, in the private sector in the public sector there were many blockchains that followed these uh, pattern of ethereum like it has a scripting language or it has a designable feature on top of that so if someone wants to use a technology or use a protocol that is used within ethereum they should be able to cut and copy and paste it on over their technology so basically it should be modular like uh, it should be as a modular part uh, component to the ethereum and that component could be fitted into another project so that was the uh, uh, one of the other philosophy the next one is agility so basically every protocol that is defined in the ethereum is not set in stone like if you want to change it you can change it but it should just follow the previous design philosophies like it should be simple the new feature should be simple it should be uh, uh modular also no, uh, the simplicity and modular it should be it, if it if it follows these features then that's okay so that is the basic uh, principle of agility then the next is non discrimination and non censorship so basically uh any any new features or any new implementation that we introduce into the ethereum uh, ethereum domain or ethereum place then it should not uh, put any constraint on the activities done by any user or it should not put any constraint or on what kind of data the user wants to upload or put into the ethereum network so basically uh, anyone should be able to do anything uh, as long as it is it is within the limit or it should not breach the integrity of the ethereum network so uh, basically there is no censorship or there is no discrimination when operating with the ethereum protocols or if you are defining a new protocol for the ethereum network so if you follow these design principles then you can actually 
design a protocol and introduce that to the Ethereum network. I mean, it takes some time, but you can do that. Now let's uh, move forward. So the simple concept um, of Ethereum is a single computer or a big computer for the entire uh, world. So basically a single blockchain for the entire world and they call it Ethereum world computer. So everyone in the world will be able to access this computer. Everyone will be able to run a part of the computer. I mean, in theory, it is called Ethereum world computer. Basically, it is a group of small, small computer waved together forming a network. And it is called Ethereum world computer. So the, uh, let me just talk about a little bit about the uh, internet. So when the internet was pioneered, the dream was to have I equalize the platform for everyone where everyone can openly and share information. I mean, yeah, it was a dream, it never happened, but this was the concept. It was a concept uh, that was driven by freedom, equality, and everything. But and even until now, we are not able to realize this concept. The internet was supposed to be uh, accessible or freely accessible. Anyone should be uh, the internet. The data shared on the internet should uh, like for the betterment of the human community. I mean, we had like a lot of concepts which that didn't really happen. We are yet to achieve those concepts. So if you currently look at the trend, the internet infrastructure is controlled by some prominent companies, internet companies in the world. I mean, we have a, something called a centralized architecture. Uh, most of the things that we need are like controlled by a big company. And if, if we look at the one of the incidents uh, that happened in last year, December, uh, if you guys, I, I hope you guys remember, in uh, 2020 December, there was an, uh, there was uh, like a 45, wind, uh, 45 time window in which Google was shut down. No one had no idea why it was stopped, but everyone felt it. No one was able to uh, communicate with each other. Companies were like on a brink of uh, stopping, like uh, standing still. Like it was like a time, time stop. At that time, we really realized the how centralized our system was. I mean, if Google shut down, when we can't be able to do anything on the internet, we won't be able to send messages because we highly depended on that centralized system. So Ethereum actually is trying to um, make this centralized system into a decentralized manner. So in case if one, uh, one peer is disabled or one peer goes off, then that doesn't matter because all the other computers are turned on and they can uh, carry on with their task just like as usual. It doesn't matter how, or like even if like 25% uh, of the peers are turned off, you, it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect the network. So we are trying to, the Ethereum, what Ethereum is trying to is uh, move this, our world internet from a centralized manner to a digital manner. So basically a world computer, a big computer for everyone. So anyone can access it and any, everyone will be able to have the copy of the contents in that computer, in their own computer. So <clears throat> that's the vision of Ethereum, one computer or one blockchain for the entire world. But it's a huge responsibility, right? It's a huge, uh, huge, I mean, it's a, inter, it's a interconnection between a lot of computers, tens and thousands of computers are interconnected together to form the Ethereum world computer. So how do we manage the integrity of this computer? I mean, it should not fall, right? It should not fail or it should not uh, show any anomalies or something like that. So there are three key properties uh, which determine or which are not determined, which are actually the foundation of the Ethereum world computer. These are determinism, terminability and isolation, isolated. So let's look into each of these. So the determinism means uh, <clears throat> any operation that is going to be executed in the Ethereum world computer should be deterministic. That means we should be able to calculate the output of that particular operation. For example, if you have an equation called A plus B plus C, and at any moment of time, I give an input for A equal to two, B equal to three, and uh, the result should be five, which should happen at any given moment. It should not vary like, uh, some other time, if you gave 2 plus 3, it should not return 4. It should always return 5. That means any operation, like it can be the simple operation as addition or it can be an uh, operation as storing your data. But that operation should have a deterministic result. It should not be something that an anomalistic or it should not lead to something anomaly. 
Then uh, the next one is terminable. Just like I mentioned before, the operation. So any operation should be deterministic. Just like that, any operation should be terminable. Any operation that is going to happen in the Ethereum network should be terminated. I mean, it should be terminated based on our will. So uh, there are there are many uh, many ways in which we can implement. We can set a timer, like after a set time, uh, the operation should terminate. Or we can uh, set a step counter, like an operation has a, a fixed number of se steps, and uh, our our step counter goes exceeding our counter or limit. Then we can stop that stop that particular instruction. Or we could set a fee meter like for each operation we could set a particular uh, fee or cost and uh, if that cost or fee exceeds a particular amount then we can stop that operation so this is the mechanism that followed by the ethereum computer and for that they use the native currency called ethereum so basically ethereum was released as a fee meter or a way in which they can achieve terminable it was later on converted. I mean, people not actually perceived it as a cryptocurrency, but the actual use of Ether was to act as a terminability agent. So act, act as a fee meter, like the unit of fee meter was established in Ether. Now the next one was isolated. So basically you are putting a code into the Ethereum well computer and executing that, right? So this code, uh, should not be able to interact with the other programs in your computer. I mean, it's a group of computer, right? So in your computer, you will be running a part of Ethereum Ethereumware computer. So anything that is uh, running on the Ethereum Ethereumware computer should not be able to interact with our computer. Like uh, someone could uh, put a virus in the Ethereum Ethereumware computer. It might not affect the Ethereum Ethereumware computer, but it could affect our computer. So that should not happen. Then vice versa also. Anything, any program that is running on our computer should not affect the Ethereum computer also. So to do that, we needed to isolate this computer and we created something called virtual machine. Virtual machines can be used, I mean, it can be used to create isolated sandbox environment. So basically it will be self-sufficient and using only a set of protocols, you can communicate with this uh, particular Ethereum computer. So anything, uh, any other program uh, communicating to this using uh, any other ways will not be able to affect the program in, in any other manner. So basically, it will also ensure determinism because uh, basically if A plus B is equal to C, uh, like two plus three uh, comes, the result of two plus three becomes four. Uh, in that case, that means something else influenced that equation or that calculation. So something like that won't happen when you, when you have an isolated sandbox and one. So these are the key features, isolation, terminability, and determinism. These were the key features or key fundamental requirements necessary for maintaining the integrity of Ethereum well computer. Now moving on, uh, as you know, Bitcoin was the predecessor of Ethereum. Uh, both are using blockchain. So there were many uh, similarities between these two blockchain technologies. But that was not the only thing. There were some differences between them. And let's just look at in, into that. So basically, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain was a distributed data storage system, which was used to store the transaction that happened in the Bitcoin. For Ethereum, it is actually uh, it actually works as a distributed data storage. But alongside that, we have some computing mechanisms also. Then uh, the native currency for Bitcoin was uh, Bitcoin, uh, BTC. Then Ethereum was Ether. That's not much of a difference, but that, that's a difference. Then the block type. I mean, um, when, uh, whenever a transaction needs to commit, it is actually grouped together, something called a block, then that is actually written into the blockchain. So for that to happen, Bitcoin needed 10 to uh, 20 minutes or uh, all, the, all those times. And for uh, Ethereum, it was actually 10 to 20 seconds, around 10 to 20 seconds. And the block size uh, for Bitcoin, I mean, this group of uh, transaction, one, tra one block was around approximately around 1 MB. Uh, and uh, for Ethereum, it's actually also like around 25 KB. I mean, it could change, but uh, not that much change. It will be around 25. Then the scripting language, I mean, uh, that was the main reason uh, the Ethereum was uh, generated or Ethereum was introduced. The scripting language, after some time, I mean, at the time Ethereum was introduced, Bitcoin didn't really had 
a scripting language but after some time they also introduced i mean they also realized the importance of a scripting language and introduced a limited uh, scripting language for that which was turing incomplete incomplete so basically what turing complete completeness means that you have an idea and you should be able to implement that using a particular language then that language can be said as turing complete so in ethereum we had something similar uh, called the smart contract uh, basically if you have an idea you can implement that in the ethereum blockchain if you ethereum blockchain lacks a feature then you can implement that then uh, at the um, mining rewards given out where um, like has how just like for uh, ethereum also the current mining reward for bitcoin is around 6 uh, alongside the uh, cost for processing each transaction and for bitcoin uh, ethereum it is 2 and uh, transaction fees were, were simple in bitcoin because basically you send some bitcoin to someone else and that's it nothing else happens there but in uh, ethereum you had some computational process like you have to call or store data call the smart contract or store the uh, data into the smart contract those kind of things were happening so the calculation of uh, transaction fee that uh, fee right that cost for execution in each instruction were a lot more complex than calculating it for bitcoin then um, like the uh, scripting language the applications that use the scripting language were called decentralized applications so basically just to be clear uh, decentralized applications are like applications who those are built on top of decentralized network like a theme so we just call them decentralized app because they it is actually working on top of or working on based on a decentralized application or decentralized network now what happens here is that rather than uh, the application controlled by a single organization we the public or the uh, participants of the network share the responsibility for controlling this application or uh, controlling this decentralized application so the uh, control or the control or the maintenance of this application gets distributed or shared among all the participants in the network in the ethereum network. and mostly uh, whenever you create a uh, decentralized application the code for that will be uh, kept open and transparent basically anyone can go into that particular repository or location if it is a smart product and go into the uh, ethereum network then audit it and uh, check if there are any problems with the smart contract if if need, it needs correction or something like that so basically it was auditable and you should you should be able to trust it because you you yourself are looking for the contract and you will be able to finalize if it, you, you are able to trust it or not due to the fact that our design philosophy of ethereum the smart contracts will be always simple now um this actually uh, people i mean for example let's imagine let's uh, take an example of google pay like if you have an application and you, you developed a mobile application either for uh, mac or like iphone or uh, android and the next process will be for you to go to android store or google play store or mac store uh, to put your application for sale so that your uh, your customers may able to access that but in case of uh, uh, ethereum you don't really need to um, wait for the uh, te tedious process done by the uh, google for uh, waiting your application you can directly go and deploy that onto the business application or sorry uh, your ethereum network and then anyone can access that so it gives you uh, some kind of freedom uh, for building new and innovative uh, solutions and piecing them together in an innovative way so that's a like that's the idea of uh, business application on top of ethereum now uh, so this might uh, give rise to some questions like is it possible like can't anyone simply come and tweak the code just as i like or um, how do the apps run in absence of a centralized control system so this is where actually the uh, smart contracts comes in the concept of smart contracts were introduced in like in the 90s i think I, I forgot but at that time it was proposed as a paper assuming that we have an immutable ledger then we can have some kind of scripting language on top of that that's how this uh, was first proposed but when uh, blockchain was introduced this was absorbed into the ethereum blockchain uh, ecosystem and with the uh, features or the nature of blockchain gives us uh, the auditability feature the immutability feature 
we will be able to implement uh, something like this uh, self executing smart contract system and which will actually control all the uh, control and govern all the things related to this this application which in turn is controlled by the network so yeah the uh, the answer to this question is yes we can do that so that's how we introduced a smart contract so simply say smart contracts is a digital representation of a normal contract uh, smart contract contains uh, contains a set of instructions that constrains any digital transaction or any form of digital uh, communication so uh, if you want to exchange money property shares or anything of value like if you have i think uh, some uh, asset have a value then you can uh, like constrain that uh, transfer of asset using smart contract in a transparent and conflict free way so basically you will be doing uh, it's a peer to peer uh, transaction it will be happening in a peer to peer network so uh, if you want to send uh, like sell your house to some other party then uh, there won't be any middleman you can directly sell it to the other party and uh, there won't be any conflict because if once you transfer the ownership that will be registered in the blockchain in an immutable manner no one can uh, alter that and it will be a proof forever there and you can uh, actually i like actually say that uh, this particular asset is my in my ownership it's transparent anyone can look into that and uh, there won't be any mistake so uh, nick sab who was a famous cryptographer Uh, actually defined the smart contract as a set of promises specified in digital form including protocols within which parties perform these promises so you have a promise based uh, for example i promise to sell uh, my house to someone else and that's a promise so this which will be governed by the smart contract until that transaction of case and even after that transaction of case it will ensure that transaction happened and the ownership has been successfully transferred so this is simply saying a smart contract so basically you have two parties or more than one or two parties and you uh, create a smart contract in a smart way like it is not inherently smart whatever constraints you define in that makes it smart so uh, then the execution happens so instead of uh, in a normal contract where you have to uh, meet then go create a smart contract notarize it using a uh, third party or you have to have some witnesses in that then that execution happens but here two parties or more than two parties meet they create a smart contract and via that smart contract they execute their transaction and in most of the cases they don't need to create a smart contract because that uh, the uh, smart contract they needed will be already there and they can just use that smart contract to do their transaction just like the house transaction then uh, what are the benefits of a smart contract so uh, this actually includes the benefits or features of the blockchain also because a smart contracts is uh, are uh, running on top of blockchain so basically dark dealing with customers we are having a peer to peer network and smart contracts also enable us to directly deal with our customers or directly deal with each other so if you, if it is a trade between houses then the owners and the other party can directly deal with each other then uh, it is resistant to failure because even if one node or two or three or node goes down it still runs the network will still run it's immutable any data that we write into the blockchain is immutable it fraud due to that fact it is fraud reduction and it cost efficiency because we are all sharing that uh, we are all having a shared uh, purpose in that so it will uh, reduce the cost and basically it is immutable that means the any data that we uh, write into that will be kept forever as long as we want so record keeping is uh, one part of that uh then um let's look at it in a technical aspect so smart contract is actually a uh, self verifying like basically if you put some data into that and you have uh, written enough conditions for that then it will look uh, verify the, those data and you put that into this thing and self executing it doesn't need any uh, external interaction or something like that once it started it will finish all the transaction related to that so in a technical aspect or even in a uh, even in uh, in someone's mind that's very uh, very uh, interesting options actually so basically you don't really need anyone else's uh, manual interaction you just need to say to do some actions and it will complete it it is tamper resistant due to the fact that it is written on an immutable ledger so that will reduce malicious or accidental events also and it is deterministic that means every outcome 
at any time uh, period will be fixed or it will be deterministic. And in an economical aspect, it provides us transparency, right? So a uh, transparency means uh, we can, uh, we don't really do redo things or we don't really need to do any other things. And then it reduces intermediaries and uh, comparatively, uh, it has less uh, transaction cost if you like compared to other blockchain technologies or other technologies that exist at then. Then in a legal aspect, uh, yeah, so it can control automatically control the execution. I, it can document any events that happened uh, during this particular execution, and it can predefine a set of conditions. And the actions will only happen within that set of conditions. Then, uh, if implemented correctly, we can also provide that uh, security for that particular contract. I mean, that uh, that based on the implementation, and it's distributed. So uh, any outcome that happens uh, due to that smart contract execution can be validated by everyone because it's it's happening in a publicly visible or transparent ledger and it's actually immutable that means uh, no one can like oh yeah i i did this uh, did this and i want to remove that that has not happen without the cons uh, consensus of the community then uh, if you want the party participants involved in the contract can be anonymous uh, like uh, in, uh, only the participant can be only known to each other. Like if I am transferring something, then the I, I'll be able. Uh, obviously, I'll be able to know that the other party in the real world. But anyone that is looking in the network won't be able to know who did this transaction. So that's a good thing. Then uh, this is actually a bad and good thing nowadays. Uh, there are no regulations. Like there are no people uh, that is there to keep an eye on what is happening. The, the same like the anonymous anonymity. So that's actually a pro and con. I mean, in some cases it might turn into a pro, and in some cases it might be con. Like uh, if uh, if people uh, started using with the, with these things, this kind of application with malicious intent, then anonymity can be a pro. Uh, sorry, uh, can be a con. And in case uh, if it is used by a genuine person, then that can be a, a pro because uh, people can really get the uh, get my private details. So that can be a pro. And just like that regulation. There are no regulations on uh, the use of blockchain, so that can be a con. Like uh, that can be, I mean, in some as aspect, that can be a con. Like uh, anyone can create any kind of application on top of blockchain, so uh, it can, uh, has to be like there are no legally uh, bounding, no no legal bounding to those kind of things. Like uh, that is happening within the network, and that is happening with the consensus of the participants that is uh, working on that application. So that can be a pro and con in uh, based on the circumstances. Then, um, yeah, uh, we've seen all the all the necessary things that are uh, for this, so like uh, the pros and some cons. But these are the, not the only uh, cons uh, that are uh, available to. Uh, sorry, that is affecting the uh, smart contract. The first thing is that smart contract can only be enforced on digital assets. Uh, basically, uh, the Ethereum world can be traced in the digital world, right? So, for example, I'm trying to transfer my house ownership to someone else, and uh, in the digital world, I said that that happened, but I didn't. Uh, uh, even after transferring the ownership, I didn't vacate the house, or I didn't do the actual procedure for that. So, any process that happens within the actual world or the physical world. Uh, cannot be constrained using the smart product that has to be done using some other mechanisms. So if you can con completely convert an asset into a digital form, then that's okay. Then you can like control all the transaction or all the ownership details regarding that into, the link, into this. But this is actually a limitation of the actual contract also because after I sell the house and I don't move, then yeah, the, you have to go some legal ways on all those things. But yeah, uh, technically speaking, a smart contract can be only enforced on digital assets. And yeah, the blockchain uh, network is decentralized, but it is not uh, re legally regulated. There is no legal constraints that is happening on the blockchain network. That is actually the aim of the blockchain network, but uh, that can be sometimes a con for that or a limitation for that. Yeah, just like I uh, said before, even if the smart uh, digital asset, uh, digital, uh, sorry, the assets are digitally enforced, then the interaction of that uh, assets in the physical world cannot be constrained by the smart contract. And uh, basically speaking, the smart contracts are uh, some constraints implemented using a statements or 
uh, it can't really implement any sophistic sophisticated variations of things like it's basically it's a if a statement and storing data and they're controlling the storage of data or controlling the retrieval of data or uh, controlling some kind of things using some computer so if you uh, need a much more sophisticated things then that has to be uh, there are workarounds but that has to be uh, hard to do that now yeah <clears throat> so yeah so finally uh, before uh, ending my talk about smart contracts i will i will just need to go through the uh, development uh, phases of a smart contract so it is similar to developing any project like uh, not only the development project uh, phases of smart contract it is closely related to decentralized application because uh, the decentralized application becomes a decentralized application when it uses the smart contract so you have to first uh, think of the product i mean that's the first thing in you have to go uh, create a product map like the release date the development date the customers who will be receiving this thing so, i mean everything related to market research all those things then you have to do a usability research like the, uh, just like the market research who will be doing this thing or uh, who will be uh, audience for this uh, particular application those kind of things then you have to design the architecture of the smart contract what will be the functions or how will it govern the transactions or yeah those kind of things then the development phase you uh, make a, a team or you appoint another company to do your smart contract development then it goes through uh, manual testing and uh, unit testing those kind of things then if you are uh, not like if you want more security like uh, smart contract is actually developed by the human right human makes mistakes so if you want to make sure there are no mistake then you can like uh, give it to another company there are like uh, third party companies that uh, look for uh, common mistakes or uh, many mistakes that happen during the development of smart contract they will audit and correct it for you and then if even if it is uh, not enough then you can like uh, conduct a bounty program like a bug bounty program and and then you can go through an, another uh, finalization of smart contract then finally you can store that into your ethereum blockchain computer sorry uh, ethereum well computer then execute that as part of your um, decentralized application so finally uh, let me just um, give you guys a brief introduction about the architecture of the decentralized application so uh, basically i mean there are uh, different variants of uh, decentralized application simply saying an application a normal application that is running on top of uh, the decentralized network is called a decentralized application so it will be using um, it, it will not only using this uh, decentralized network like it will not not only be using the ethereum network or the smart contract it will be using every other thing like the database the hosting platforms every other thing alongside the blockchain technology i mean we can really uh, only use the blockchain technology I mean, in some applications in case of some applications we can use only use the blockchain technology but in real life use cases we have to use a mix of these technologies so uh, basically you will have the ethereum ethereum blockchain uh, technology and uh, on that you have already deployed the smart contract which can be uh, accessed using a wallet so basically speaking wallet i, I mentioned that there will be some kind of a uh, login mechanism to the ethereum well computer but some kind of credential mechanism right so that credential mechanism will be managed by something called wallet and uh, some application might access via the wallet or some application might directly access the blockchain network without the usage of wallet or some uh, uh, blockchain network clients might have the wallet included in them and your client could be a desktop client a mobile client or a web client that is hosted on a uh, decentralized uh, platform or a centralized platform sorry a distributed uh, hosting platform or a centralized hosting platform then uh, yeah there are uh, many other variation like uh, a desktop client that uh, access um, a server side client that is hosted on a centralized or hosting platform then that access a blockchain network there are many other variations just like the our normal web application or normal application that is currently we are developing but the only uh, thing is that only change is that we will be using a blockchain uh, alongside the that already using databases or some else kind of thing now these are uh, generally uh, the things uh, the stuff that i want to talk about the ethereum journey or the ethereum 
uh, we uh, so to summarize we have uh, something called uh, ethereum world computer basically one big computer for the entire world that was the concept uh, in which ethereum was built on uh, where you have a business idea you can code it and deploy it to the ethereum world computer and you can run it and you, every audience will be able to access that particular computer that was the dream i mean that was the dream that we are building towards the ethereum computer we have still achieved it completely uh, like we have some issues like scalability all those things but in the future we will definitely achieve that so let me uh, show you guys a demo of a decent application how that interact with the ethereum blockchain network all those things so yeah okay so uh, let me just introduce you guys to this application so basically uh, this decentralized application is for issuing certificates so there will be two actors uh, one will be the issuer and uh, the uh, other person will be the candidate who will be able to view their certificate so simply imagine this as a uh, step down version of kbs sati chain uh, the sati chain application is uh, an application where you can where we actually uh, issue our certificates for the different courses such as a certificate blockchain associate certificate ethereum developer those kind of uh, 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 courses uh, certificates will be issued on blockchain and the product uh, product is called the sati chain so you guys can go check it out uh, in our kb website so this is actually a uh, much stripped down version of that particular thing so there are two functions that we can do using this thing the first one is to issue a certificate so basically you can issue a certificate by selecting the particular course then you can view that particular um, result also uh, let me just um, confirm one thing okay so basically uh, if you are creating an application that is fully relayed on the full uses um, almost all the potential i can show everything but this thing actually uses a wallet to manage the credential to the ethereum network so you will have a username to interrupt and then your uh, screen is not visible could you please share it no oh, okay let me check so this is actually a step down version of the sati chain uh, version and um, here we have two options uh, two methods uh, two features two features one is to issue a certificate and uh, the other is to view that particular certificate and i am using uh, something called metamask metamask is actually a wallet that can be used to control my credential to the ethereum sorry ethereum network or ethereum computer so simply saying um, this is my actually my account uh, that uh, can be similar to the username or uh, username that you use you use to log into google or facebook and uh, Uh, it has corresponding password but that will be managed by metamask and that will be only stored in my computer basically if you uh, close it or uh, delete this instance of metamask then uh, you have to restore it using other mechanisms okay so i'll be using this uh, wallet to interact with the ethereum uh, network and the ethereum computer then i'll be using th something called uh, ether scan which is actually a block explorer uh, using which you can explore all the contents or all the actions that is per, uh, we performed within the ethereum network so i'll show uh, what will happen when i interact with the ethereum network all, with using these tools okay i hope that this thing uh, works completely so the first thing is to log in or connect using metamask so let me just go ahead and do that so uh, basically uh, what happens here is that i am connecting my particular account via metamask so uh, anything that happens within this uh, decentralized application will be uh, will be using my account so uh, remember when i said that uh, i terminability terminability feature of ethereum well computer it had a fee meter right a cost so doing any anything within the ethereum network and with those things are called transactions so like if you write a data that is called a transaction you read a data that is also called a transaction so for any transaction there will be a set amount of um, cost only for the writing uh, right transaction not for the read transaction so for any write transaction there will be a set amount of cost and i am telling that to use this particular uh, account to uh, for that uh, particular cost so yeah let me go ahead and uh, connect to this particular site so i am now connected to 
uh, my my site is running on localhost 3000 so i'm connected to that particular site using that particular account so my site has access to this account and uh, it can uh, do access based on that so next let me issue a certificate so yeah i'll just uh, enter a certificate id kba cba 101 and uh, and to and this was actually issued on this particular month so basically the course name certificate id uh, the candidate name uh, the particular amount grade that occurred and the issue date so issuing certificate that is actually a right transaction into the blockchain network. so it will have uh, to do some operations within the ethereum network so you need to have a particular cost for that so this will be the actual cost that is needed for uh, doing this particular transaction so just confirm that and it will take a little bit of time if you go into the metamask you can see that there is a pending transaction and if you go into the either scan i mean either scan takes a little bit of time to read that particular transaction so let's just wait maybe the transaction will complete before the scan uh, reads that Yeah, the sun transaction is is complete uh, let me just check the trans uh, yeah so over here you can see what happened when i did that transaction so this is a transaction hash so whenever a transaction happens in the ethereum network it can you can see a unique id will be generated for that and using that unique id you can retrieve that uh, that transaction the data corresponding to that transaction everything will be there and the status uh, basically it says that um, it happened uh, the uh, transaction was successfully uh, carried out and in which block it was happened and uh, when it happened and from which account to which other account so basically uh, both a query scripting language we were calling this uh, smart contract so that contract will also have some kind of credential but that will be managed by the uh, code that is associated with our smart contract and uh, uh, for from account that means my account the account that I used and uh, to this particular contract I didn't send any either value, but I sent some data uh, So like uh, to decode the input you have to have the corresponding smart contract, but yeah, so this is the uh, number of transaction I uh, did from this particular address and uh, gas used to for uh, the cost for that particular transaction so like uh, for it is i i mentioned that it is uh, like represented in either like 0 0.001 either but uh, you can see another amount here that is because it's uh, it's mentioned in way which is actually the smallest denomination of either like for example for uh, rupees we have something called paisa right like one paisa two paisa like hundred paisa is one rupees or something like that so just like that for either we have something called way i mean there are uh, so many denomination but the smallest denomination is way and everything is expressed in way internally everything happens internally it will be expressed in way the gas cost the fee or everything something like that and uh, this fee is called gas cost or gas and yeah so this is basically the input data the all these things uh, the uh, course name certificate id um, the candidate name and you, everything uh, is shown as the input data this is actually encoded into it's actually the encoded form you if you have the correct decoding uh, mechanism then you can record that yeah then uh, if, uh, if if we go back and uh, yeah, let's copy the certificate id try to retrieve that certificate then you can see uh, who that certificate is for and you can see all the data corresponding that so uh, this is basically how a decentralized application simply works so whenever you want to issue a certificate you can you need to uh, provide that particular certificate details regarding that certificate uh, the name of the candidate the grade and these are actually all, all the data regarding that certificate but whenever you issue a certificate on blockchain so uh, why the blockchain has a transaction cost or transaction fee is that uh, basically 
you guys may be remembering about the torrent networks right yeah so the accidentally clicked it so in the torrent network whenever uh, we i mean you see we use the torrent network to download cinemas or films or something like that so uh, people that use the torrent network always use it to download some content but that content need to be hosted by some peer right so the number of peers that host this content are very low in this network so basically uh, people take from the network and are not willing to give into the network because why downloading uh, gives you a benefit right you, you will be able to uh, view or use that particular download content but if you upload it will be a waste of data all those kind of things so uh, within the blockchain network uh, people can do transactions so uh, if you uh, make the transaction fee then uh, people that verify the transaction might not get in so uh, people will not verify the transaction only people uh, will do transaction so uh, people will do the transaction no one be, will be there to verify the transaction that means uh, every transaction will be having the status pending so uh, if you have a transaction cost and that cost will be given to those people that verify and vet these transactions so that's why we have a transaction fee within the ethereum network then the other thing is that uh, if you don't have transaction fee uh, like anyone can do many transaction like i send zero uh, either to anju or some other co colleague of mine and i can do this an infinite amount of time if there is no cost so that is why to once to one is to avoid spamming and one is to encourage people to verify the uh, transaction that is happening on the blockchain so that's why we have a transaction cost then uh, we confirm uh, like we sent uh, we uh, we collect all the data we need and when we when we uh, create a trans particular transaction build the transaction then to uh, execute that transaction we need to specify some uh, inter or some uh, cost for that for the execution of the those uh, operations then we confirm that and here i am like simply using this metamask wallet to do that uh, a wallet uh, using which you can interact with the ethereum network and i can see the uh, the transaction that happened and the details regarding that and you, uh, we can explore that in this network also so the another thing to mention is that here i am using uh, the ethereum network called rinkup there are a uh, different ethereum network the uh, one is called main network see uh, this is actually the main ethereum network i mean this is where the ether has value like uh, one either is uh, actually amount to almost uh, 2000 usd so this is the, this is a network where ether has value and all these other network are a uh, test network so using this metamask i can like uh, seamlessly connect within different networks so currently i'm connected to uh, ringabi network so that i I mean, uh, it's a demo purpose, right? So I can't really uh, spend it really either. And so you can use the test networks to do that. And if you have an application, you can like first deploy into a test network, uh, like satisfy with its working condition and all those things. So currently, all of the networks are not really working well. That's why I use the Rinkapi network. Then uh, one one important, uh, one uh, curious thing I want to show is that the zero the block or the Genesis block, whenever you uh, commit a blockchain the zero of the block is called the genesis block and i uh, told you that the <coughs> uh, when uh, crowdfunding happened the people were promised either uh, for giving money right they are uh, they have around uh, 14 million they they amused uh, like uh, they had uh, they received around 14 million for their crowdfunding and these are all the transaction that in which they have given out the ether corresponding to the cash that was given by the community so you guys want to go ahead and you guys can like explore the ethereum network using either scan and you can interact with the ethereum network using metamask and yeah so yes that's basically a simplified implementation of uh sati chain where you can like uh, go ahead and uh, issue a certificate and uh, retrieve the details regarding that certificate.